I went ahead today and harvested my hikama root plants. This is them right here. This is what I've got out of the totality of what I planted. But I ended up having to pull them in a little early. I'll tell you why in just a moment. They did okay. Uh, they were better than I thought. I didn't even realize I had roots growing because the tops of them had not gotten large like I thought they would. But I did have a few roots, and I'm proud of them. I'm going to cut them in a little bit and see what all I can save out of them. There was a reason that I had to take them out early, and I'll tell you why. And that reason is because I have an armadillo. I have an armadillo, and so I decided to at least salvage my jicama plants and pull out the roots before the armadillo did any more damage. Let me show you what's going on. When you come out of my front door, in this area to the left, between my ramp and my mobile home, used to be just a nice area of wood chips. And then I was growing my red latham raspberry bushes in there. Well now, all of a sudden, the last few days, I've had a lot of damage of something rooting all around in here scraping back all the wood chips and digging up everywhere. It's even been knocking into these lights that I had to give light if we're walking up the ramp at night. It completely knocked that one over. It's digging up little holes all along our trailer and it's completely tearing apart all of my raspberries. It's got some of them laying over sideways and it's digging a hole down by the bottom of the raspberries and really just splitting them all apart and having its way with them. Also, along my ramp where I planted the Taylor Dwarf horticultural beans, and I have a few yard long beans in here too, but look at all the little footprints and steps and it's knocking over beans and it does that all the way down. This was a smooth row. It didn't have all these divots in it everywhere. It was a smooth row. <laughs> and now it's like a little playground. Look all up under my ramp. It's digging everywhere. This section especially. And this has only been this way the last two or three days but I know what it is. I know exactly what it is. This is the little area that the jicama seeds were planted and they were growing. I didn't even realize that I had roots on those plants because really the greenery had not grown out a whole lot. But when I discovered <laughs> that the armadillo had been getting into them and I discovered it by looking down there and seeing that I had roots laying on top of the soil now, not under the soil, but on top of the soil and I knew exactly what was going on. The reason is, is because a few weeks ago, I had another armadillo. I had been thinking something was kind of digging around our trailer, but I wasn't really sure. And you know, I've had a lot of trouble with my dogs this year getting into everything. So I was wondering if it was them, but it wasn't kind of the digging they normally do. So I wasn't really sure. And then one night, my husband and I were sitting in the house. It was after supper. We're just sitting in the house. He's watching TV and all. And all of a sudden we hear a gunshot right outside. <laughs> And we both said, first I was like, what was that? But then I was like, well, our son must be home and he must have shot a snake or something. But when he came inside, he said, yeah, he said, that was me. He said, uh, but we had an armadillo. He said the dogs pinned it over in part of the yard. And so he got the gun and he went over there and shot it. I'm glad he did. I got no problem with shooting an armadillo. They will tear up your yard. They will ruin stuff. But that's how I knew that we for sure did have one a few weeks ago. And that's how I knew that we have another one now because it's the same exact kind of digging, the same exact kind of rooting in the same exact parts of our yard. So that's why I had to harvest those. And I'm gonna try them in a little while when I go in and cook supper. I'm making some pork rib things that I had canned a long time ago, trying to use up some of that, uh, those items that I canned in 2020. And I'm gonna be cutting a lot of bell peppers and stuff. And I might just throw a little of that in there and just see what it tastes like. Um, I hope it's mature enough. I hope they taste okay. I think the bigger ones will be all right. I'm gonna go ahead and try it in one of our meals tonight. 
Since I brought up the pork ribs, I thought I would just update you on my progress with actually using a lot of this food from 2020. I had really stayed busy in 2020. I put back a lot of food and I, we ate a lot of it, but I had so much that a lot of it just sat and sat. And then when we had our move, it was stored up. And then when we got in our house, um, I just organized it in the pantry, in the closet area. And I realized now that I need to pull it out and I need to make sure I use it and I need to plan meals around it because it's gonna go into its fourth year. And I don't really like to keep jarred food that long if I don't have to, I'm gonna try to rotate it out. I had this whole shelf full and that whole shelf full, completely full to front and back. And now you can see that a whole quarter is open. I've got a basket there. And you can see that I've used part of this side. A lot of this side is just my dehydrated food right there. And even some over there on that side is just dehydrated. The only thing I really have left on this shelf is some of my greens, kale, collard greens, seven top turnip greens, the food at the bottom, some of it's ghee, but I have some more green beans, some more cherry tomatoes, some chicken, some corn, and some sweet potatoes. And I, I'm not worried about it. I can roll through a lot of that. I've been doing good. <laughs> it's not been a hard thing to work through a quarter of that food or a little more, but I had to be deliberate about it. I couldn't just be willy-nilly about it. I would have to think to myself, what can I do with it? Like I started to make chicken soup the other day and normally I just make chicken soup with broth, maybe put some noodles in it, some onions, celery, things like that. Well, I saw a recipe in the ball canning cookbook. It was a recipe for canning to put up in jars, but you don't have to can it if you don't want to. You can just use the recipe and make the soup. Well, the soup called for two quarts of home canned tomatoes or a 28 ounce um, can of like store-bought tomatoes. Well, I had tomatoes on this shelf and that recipe was gonna allow me to use two quarts. <laughs> so I was so excited to be able to grab two big quarts off of this shelf. When I'm cooking other things at night, I think to myself, okay, what kind of side dish? What, what vegetable might be a side dish with this or whatever? I go for green beans. I'm not going for my canned foods from the stores right now. I'm going for like things that I have from 2020, purple whole peas, green beans, things like that. And so it's been kind of easy. I've used chicken off of this shelf. I've made chicken salad with like half the jar. The other half of the jar, I made some pasta, some tortellini and chicken stuff the other night that my son loved and took to lunch the next day to work. So if you just keep thinking in your mind, okay, what can I do with this? What can I do with that? It work, You work through it and you get that old stuff out of the way, but you have to be deliberate about it. And I don't think that if the majority of this was still hidden back in my closet, I'd be having as much luck. It's in my line of sight. When I'm sitting here eating breakfast in the morning, I'm looking at this. When I'm eating dinner at night, I'm looking at it. And that has been the game changer for me to work through it. And I still have been going in my closet and grabbing a few things every now and then, like purple whole peas or things like that. And we've worked those in too. So, cause I still have some things in there that I just couldn't fit out here, but it's working. It's working and I'm proud of it. <laughs> you set a goal and you're, it, this has given me like a, a literal visual image that I can look at and see that I've made progress on. And sometimes you just need to know you've made progress and it feels good. I know that you've been hearing from me last time I posted and from other people about the serious droughts in our area. The heat, we went over 30 something days with nothing but three digit temperatures in the all day long, just about. All the things I'm showing you right now that still look green and healthy, that's only because they're in the shade. And it's only because a couple of days ago we started getting sprinkles and rain and some of this stuff has just popped. <laughs> it's just popped. All of this has been here long enough to have grown twice this size and to put off pods and, and have blooms and set pods and have peas and stuff in them. These are the zipper cream peas, but they're half the size they're supposed to be. I'm leaving them here, of course, because they look so good. And I'm gonna just see how they do now that we finally, finally have gotten some moisture. And I'm gonna see how they do. I looked down here today and I saw one little bloom coming on there. And that tells me 
that they're getting what they need. The temperatures have come down starting yesterday, which was Monday. Today's Tuesday, August 29th. The temperatures have started coming down in the 80s and 90s now. <laughs> the 90s at the heat of the day, 90 something, but then like 70s and 80s in the morning. Oh my gosh, we haven't had that in months. And you can tell that the plants are just breathing a sigh of relief. This is my Sea Island cowpeas. Haven't seen one bloom on them. Haven't seen any pods. And that's not normal, but that's the plant being defensive, I guess, in this heat. It just didn't set pods. It didn't have blooms. So I'm hoping now it will. I'm just hoping. Um, I feel like it should because they're doing so good that I just feel like they're going to start shortly coming around. Over here is where I had tomato plants and kakuzas. All of them dried up. None of them gave me really anything after the first few tomatoes I got off of there at the spring and you know beginning of summer. Once June, middle of June came to now, nothing. And anything that kind of was toward the sun just dried up. Uh, everything in like these beds along my driveway dried up. My little corn patch that was so thriving during my spring garden is done for now. <laughs> I'm not I'm not worried about it. I'm not over here pouting. It is what it is. I've just kind of left the grass and stuff in there because there was no point in trying to weed when I wasn't going to be planting anything. And I definitely wasn't going to be planting anything in all this heat. So I, I thought I would, but it just became apparent that the best thing I could do is just leave this grass and all here to at least protect the soil. Still got some watermelon vines running around there, but I'm not looking for any watermelons off of them. Here's my little test plot of landrace corn. And as you can see, it's, it's done for. It's tasseled already, but no ears set. And that's okay. This stuff <laughs> i call it stuff now it's because it's not vegetables that are going to be harvested this stuff bless its heart didn't get any rain for two months withstood 100 to 105 107 109 degree heat for 30 days and you know did the best it could now that the rain has started maybe like this pepper plant that's not dead yet it's it's hanging in there this is the sheep nose pimento plant. Maybe it'll pop back. I'm gonna leave it. But I have plans here shortly for, for the front half of my garden, but then also for the back half. When I go to do something, sometimes maybe I make it a little harder than some other people would, but it's just my way of staying organized because I can't seem to finish things a lot of the times because of other things I have to do. And I have to go back to projects later. And this helps keep me aware of where I was, what I have done, what I haven't done. Let me just jump in and show you. Right here it said, the bed's extending off the west end of my house. Now here is the front corner of my trailer. And you know, I put the azalea branch little bed there. And then I put two more sections later on extending off of that. It kind of, it actually doesn't hook that much of a 90. <laughs> off the front of my house. It hooks a little more towards the back, but this is just a drawing. But what I did was I earmarked to put Blue Lake pole beans all along here. I went to bed last night and all of a sudden it hit me. Did I put Blue Lake pole beans there or did I put Blue Lake bush beans? <laughs> I haven't even double checked myself yet, so I don't know. Either way, I just wanted green beans, but I sure hope I pulled the pole beans out of the right drawer and not the bush beans. And then up here, I'm putting some Eagle Pass okra. Now, I know it seems late to plant okra, but it's still hot as heck here. And this okra is only like a 50 to 60 day okra. And I'm using seeds from when I saved the okra at my old house. So I'm hoping they'll be adapted to my area and they'll grow. I have not had a great okra year here, except for jambalaya okra that's in my little sugar kettle. But anyway, I went out there today and I got everything done. Chop and drop plants, rake out around the azalea uh, branch thing, till up as best I can, add potato dirt if any is left. That's the dirt from the other part of my property where I planted potatoes last year. I'm not gonna put them back there anymore. So I'm moving that dirt to other beds just to help kind of add more nutrients and all to it. And then to fertilize the beds. As I did things, I checked it off. 
And as I planted things, I put a check back, check by Blue Lake. So this is done. I'm calling this one the Kakuza bed. It basically has the same little instructions, you know, clean up, till up, fertilize, reform the beds. At the corners, I'm planting baby bubba okra. And I did that, put a check by it, there's my check. To this front part up here, I'm planting climbing brown speckled cowpeas. And as you can see, I put a check there and they're done. To the back two sections, just a while ago, I planted rattlesnake pole beans. I had planted some a couple months ago. They did not make it through the heat. So I'm hoping now that the heat's kind of moderated, I can still get some rattlesnake pole beans. They are one you can plant late. So that's this bed. So I'm just kind of taking a page and making myself a task list for each little section of my yard, hoping it doesn't overwhelm me to do it all if I do it in bite-sized pieces. Those I just showed you are what I did yesterday. This morning, I worked on the ramp area. This first one, I haven't done yet. The azalea branch section, which is the little section that's right by my ramp entrance from the carport coming up the ramp, it's that azalea branch section where I had the pink half runner beans that grew this year. I'm gonna, uh, I cleaned it all out this morning and I'm gonna put some green arrow peas there. And what I've done is I've, whatever I'm planting, I've gone ahead and gotten seeds out and I've set the seeds here on top of the sheet, <laughs> right on top of the sheet where I'm gonna be using it and I'm having it all organized. And then as soon as I open these seeds, if I use them all fine, if I don't, Whatever's left, I'm putting right back up into my seed drawer instead of leaving it everywhere. Number three there, I had put to leave the Italian heirloom tomatoes through the fall, maybe plant lettuces afterwards, but I decided to just pull them out. I pulled them out this morning. I think they had too much damage to just leave them there. And I had wrote to plant the New Zealand spinach. So I grabbed my New Zealand spinach seeds that I have from the co-op and put them in my pile there where the Evra purple ball tomatoes are, and I'm leaving those there because they look pretty good. I'm gonna plant these daikon radishes. I planted them last year in the other beds that are by my carport, and they grew really fast. They didn't set very long roots because I pulled them out because I was just ready to plant other things. But these I'm gonna leave to overwinter. So I'm hoping they'll set some roots, they'll overwinter in that spot and just kind of help break up the dirt. That's my goal with that. And number five, those two beds that are along the carport, I wrote here to the front, plant the dwarf SX rape. I'll tell you why in just a second. And to the back, plant the Oregon sugar pod peas. And here's my Oregon sugar pod peas that I got from the co-op. The sugar pod peas will probably need some support from those uh, panels, those metal panels. So that's why I'm putting them to the back. The Dwarf SX Rape is strictly being planted. It's a brassica. It sets a pretty good taproot, and it gives um, leaves that you can eat. Of course, deer like them as well, but I haven't really had any deer problem, knock on wood. But you can harvest them to eat. They're really delicious. However, that taproot helps break up the soil, and it reaches way down in there and pulls up nutrients toward the top of the soil. So I'm gonna plant those here. If you plant them in September, they should have time to come up and kind of get established. And then they'll overwinter. The, the weather doesn't bother them real bad and they'll be there when the spring comes. And when I get to a certain point, I can pull them out, but they'll be doing their job in the meantime. I know it may bore you to kind of go over each little area, but I'm gonna just do it as quick as I can so that it give people some ideas maybe of what they can plant. Um, of course, depends on where you live. <laughs> We're down here in the hot, hot South but I'm just gonna let you kind of know what I'm doing. This long bed by the tree in front of my house, it's where I have the fair ozone peppers right now and where I had the melons growing, but the melons didn't do that good. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna plant some elite zucchini, which is this, some more zucchini. Around here, we can plant zucchini up to August and September and still have a chance of getting some. The peppers that are there right now, I'm gonna leave them because I could tell after the rains, they're kind of coming back and they're setting some blooms and all. So I'm gonna leave them, but I'm, I wrote here to maybe intersperse with some rutabagas and just kind of throw some rutabagas in there. At the other side of them, I'm gonna put some early round Dutch cabbage. I got these seeds from my co-op, I've never grown it. Don't know a clue about growing cabbage, 
but I'm trying to put it up near the house a little bit like that so I can really keep my eye on it and water it when I need to. By October, this zucchini will probably be coming out at some point in October, and I'm gonna replace that with my kohlrabi, my free seed that I got from Baker Creek one time. I have grown this before, this early purple Vienna kohlrabi, and um, it's it's okay, it's done all right around here. I mean, the taste is fine. It's not, the, the taste is more than okay, but it grows okay around here. It's kind of hot around here. You have to be careful to not grow it when it's too hot, but if you let it cool off a little bit, it does okay. The two beds along my driveway, I just kind of sketched them out here. This entire bed that go, that's closest to my road, I'm gonna put all with American Purple Top rutabagas. I've got them in a Ziploc bag there. <laughs> it's uh, just stuff from my co-op that I got, but I'm gonna go ahead and plant those. We can plant those now and I need to get those going. This other bed, I'm gonna try to get a few more green beans this year and um, not just the Blue Lakes, but at one end, I'm gonna plant these black Valentine beans. The black Valentines are beautiful to grow and to pick and I only have one pack of them. So I thought they would fit good at this end of this little bed, front and back. I'm also gonna intersperse some chives. I got these from Fedco Seeds, they're called Nelly Chives. And they're supposed to be a perennial, so we're gonna see how that works out. Man, it's so hot here, it's so hard to get some perennials growing. It, it's just really hot. But um, we'll see how it works out. In the middle section, all up in here, I'm sorry I have scribble writing there, but I ended up changing it to white icicle radishes. And I'm gonna put these out. These were one that in our area, I could plant from March to September. It's August 29th, that's close enough to September, and. According to this, I could plant it in August anyway, so I'm gonna go ahead and put these out in that section. The last section over here, I'm gonna put beans, beans here, and then chives in the middle. But I'm gonna put these Cantari beans, that's the way I pronounce it, don't know if that's right or not. But these are from Baker Creek, and these win the prize for the most beautiful bush beans I've ever grown. They're a beautiful plant, and they put off the most beautiful set of beans that you can imagine. I'm hoping they'll do good. I'd really love to put up some more green beans this year. This one could be a little confusing, but just go with it. The azalea branch bed that I have in the front of my house. If you were looking out my front door, you'd be looking right at that azalea branch bed. What I'm gonna do there is weed it really good. I'm gonna fertilize it a little bit, and then I'm gonna put in my Thomas Laxton English peas. I grew those along my house. This spring, uh, late winter to spring, they did well. I only have a few more seeds left of those, so I'm gonna plant them over there and get some fall peas going. On the other side of these azaleas that are gonna be gone, there's a bed over here. I have a lot of tomatoes in it right now and I had some melons in it, but I'm gonna just make this a complete turnip bed. I'm gonna grow the hakari, the shogun, and the golden globe turnips in this bed right here. I have seeds from Wilhite Company for the Hakurai turnips. I have seeds from my co-op for the Shogoin turnips. And I have seeds from Thresh Seed Company for my gold ball turnips. I'm just gonna try a little something different with these varieties and I'm gonna try to grow a good many of them. I am trying to make some things that I can sell. And so Everybody usually has the um, purple top turnips around here, so I'm trying to grow a few different things. However, I have my whole bag of turnip seeds and turnip green seeds here, and I'm gonna plug those in wherever I can all throughout my yard. So I'm, I'm gonna try to have a big variety of things. We're just gonna see how it goes. I don't know how the weather's gonna be, but right now I'm having faith. I have another little small azalea branch bed that connects these two beds. And that one, I'm gonna put the Marvel of Venice yellow pole beans. I used these last year, about half the pack, and I only had a half a pack left. So I'm gonna put those in that little spot so that they can grow on those azalea branches. There's a bed that hooks off of here where I had some Dallas Edwards pole beans that didn't do that great. I'm gonna put some flat Dutch cabbage there. That's some more seed that I got from my co-op and I'm gonna try. This last bed that I drew over here actually hooks on to this bed. 
but I call it my Jubilee tomato bed because that's where my I had my Jubilee tomatoes planted. I know you can't read that because it's sideways, but later in September, I'm gonna plant some broccoli. This is called Spigarellio lysia, but it's supposed to be kind of like a, a smaller broccoli on little smaller stalks. And also you can plant it now in like September or so around here and overwinter it. And it's supposed to do okay overwintering. But we're just going to see. This is just for us to eat. Um, I don't need any big, huge heads of broccoli or anything. I'd love to grow some just small little shoot-type heads. And I'm going to try this. It's supposed to be delicious. In the small corn patch, which is what I call that long section that my neighbor tilled up for me in my front yard, I had planted his honey cream corn there and... Just got a little bit off of it, not a whole lot, because it kind of uh, bit the dirt in the heat. But what I'm going to do there is row it up, fertilize it, do everything, and I'm going to plant some beets, some tall Utah celery, some Chinese Mishahili cabbage. I'm going to plant some Viola di Milano turnips. Those are some purple turnips. Well, they're white with purple tops. I've actually grown them before, and they grew really easily, so that's why I'm going with that again. I'm going to pick out a couple of the radish rows to put in there, and then I'm putting two rows of Swiss chard and two rows of kale. I don't really know exactly how many rows I'm going to have in here, so some of this could change, but that gives you an idea of what I'm going to do. I chose the avalanche beet. I have heard the white beets taste better than the red beets, and I'm not a big beet person, but I'm hoping that uh, I'll like these. This is just a generic celery seed from Fairy Morse, the tall Utah. It's a very popular version, variety, I should say. These are my Chinese Mishahili cabbage that I got from a co-op. I don't know, dollar. You know, you can't, can't beat that. This is my Viola di Milano turnips I got from Annie Seeds. They're 40 days for baby turnips, so I'm thinking they're about 50 to 60 days for a decent-sized turnip. I may wait till a little bit later to plant those, maybe in the next few weeks, not right now. Same with these radishes. I'm not gonna plant these right now, but I chose the sparkler radish for this bed. And I was gonna try these Helios golden radishes from Hoss Tools. Had them a while and hadn't planted them. I'm gonna go with this Lacinato kale that I have from Hoss Tools. I actually have Lacinato kale from two or three different companies, but I just chose that pack. I'm going to put in some more of this Burpees rhubarb chard. It's a Swiss chard. It's not rhubarb, but um, I did grow this in the spring, and I had good luck with it. So I'm going to try that again, and I'm also going to try to throw in there some Ford Hook Giant Swiss chard. So we'll see what happens. In my big corn patch, the one I was out talking to you in front of a while ago, I'm going to do all my chopping, dropping, and tilling and everything. But what I'm going to do is, in the first half of the garden, the first half, I'm going to put a bunch of mustard greens and collard greens. Along each side of it, where I had the half runner beans before, I'm going to put English peas. I'm going to go with the Wando here and the early perfection there. But this back half here, the back half of the corn patch, I'm going to sow in oats. I'm just going to try it. I want so badly to try some of these cover crops. And it's hard to do cover crops. Not that they're hard to grow, but it's hard to figure out when you're going to rotate a bed out and everything. This bed has only been going for the spring. That's as new as it is. But I'm thinking that I want to go ahead and try a cover crop in it. And so I chose the oats and we're going to see what happens. For my mustard greens here, I'm going to put some Florida broadleaf mustard greens. For my collard greens, I'm going to try some Morris Heading collard greens. Got a big old bag of Wando green peas. The Wandos are supposed to do pretty good. Got my early perfection peas. And I think I just got these from, um, I, they might have been from Tractor Supply. And then I have my big old bag of oat seeds. Well, I think I told you, and maybe in the last video, that I was getting a tiller. And I did. I got me a tiller a few weeks ago. And I had an issue, and I'll tell you about that in a second, but um, I actually was only able to start using it yesterday morning. But that was okay because it was so dry that I didn't want to get out there and till anyway. And so after we had a little sprinkle Sunday evening, um, I got out there yesterday morning and did what I had to do. And y'all, it helped me so much. 
It helped me so much. I felt like by lunchtime, I had gotten more done than I would have gotten all day long before, or maybe even wouldn't have even got it all done in one day before. It helped me so much. I know there's all kind of deals with tillers and a lot of people don't use them, don't want them or anything. Two reasons I did, because number one, I kind of needed to have an expenditure for my business for tax reasons, which I was telling you about in other videos. Um, I need to offset a little bit of our capital gains we have, and I'm gonna offset that with my business. I'm planning on hopefully growing a few things I can sell for this winter, this fall, and I need to get some planting areas ready now. Not two years from now, but now. <laughs> I need to get them ready now. And so I bought me a tiller and I can tell already it's a godsend. So what I did first was I went out there yesterday morning and I reworked and reshaped the bed that goes along the front of my trailer to the right of my ramp if you were coming out my front door. Uh, it used to be a little bit kind of uh, kidney shaped and all. I was kind of going for a shape that might look like landscaping. Uh, I ditched all that <laughs> and I just made it a true rectangle yesterday. I made it a true rectangle and I tilled it, I planted it, fertilized it, it's done. I've got the whole bed done already and it's so, it just feels so good. And what my thinking was when getting this tiller is because, you know, I bought soil last year that I wasn't happy with. Um, it looked good, it smelled good, it, it had sand in it, it had little bark chips in it, it had soil in it, it looked good. But apparently it didn't have a whole lot of minerals in it. And when I would plant certain things, like beans in it, some of them would come up, germinate, come up and look okay, and then they would not do good. And I can't have that anymore. <laughs> But I don't want to just go scraping all that dirt off because one thing about the dirt is it's had a growing season now where things did germinate and come up and set roots in it. Even if they didn't thrive forever, there was root systems in there. And some things did do okay, like my keberica beans and all, and I chopped and dropped those. So those root systems and all were down in that soil. Uh, I've been putting as much debris and things as I can on the soil. So I wasn't just gonna scrape it off and start over. But what I wanted to do was run the tiller over it and bring some real dirt up into it. Some of that organic soil I bought would go down and real dirt would come up and then it would all kind of sift and that's what happened. So yesterday when I was doing that bed, that's exactly what was happening is I was getting now a mixture of my real soil, which is good soil. I have pretty good soil in the front of my house here. I was getting that good soil mixed in with the other soil that I'm not completely happy with and mixing it all up really good. And then I walked over with my wheelbarrow and took soil from my potato beds, my rows where I had potatoes before. And I also brought some of that over there and mixed it up. I fertilized everything and I planted. I planted big kahuna beans in that bed yesterday and I planted, um, some pick and pack squash. I don't get, I don't, I didn't show you that paper a while ago, but that's what I did in that bed. And so it's done. I've got it done. And then I rolled to the next area. The next area I took care of was I tilled all along those um, little beds that hook off from the end of my house. It starts with the azalea branch little bed. And then I have two more sections that hook off from the west side of my house. I tilled all the way down one side of those posts and all the way on the back side, came through, mixed it up real good, raked it flat, everything. I put fertilizer in there, raked it out really good, and I planted. I planted the Blue Lake pole beans, and I just checked, and I did grab pole beans. I, I had this, you lay down at bed at night, and you start thinking, did I plant pole beans or bush beans? But I just checked. I did plant pole beans. So I planted the Blue Lake pole beans and the Eagle Pass okra there. Got it done checked. It's done. I mean, it's done. I also hauled some potato dirt to that bed too. So between those two beds, that's where I put uh, the majority of the dirt from my potato bed. I also rolled around and went to the Kakuza bed area, which is kind of shaped like a Y. It kind of has the three sections like a Y. I put the last of my potato dirt in those areas and then I tilled it all in. I got it all 
mixed up really good because those beds were purely that organic soil I bought. They had no original dirt really mixed up in there. So I felt better after tilling that up, tilling it up, raking it all, fertilizing it. And I planted the climbing speckled pole beans there and the rattlesnake pole beans and a few of the baby bubba okra. So got it done. Those are three areas that I got completed before like two o'clock yesterday. Three areas that I got completed before two o'clock. Planted, done, flipped the beds, got it done. I was so excited. So when it comes to like my corn patch, when I wanna plant these oats in the back of my corn patch, that dirt needs to have fluff to it so that when I plant those oat seeds, I can kind of rake them all in and I can mist them and, and keep them kind of wet until they start to germinate. And I'm, if I just threw them out there now, they would be landing on a lot of kind of clayish like soil with weeds in it. I'm going to come through there. It's going to be a job because it's a big area, but I'm going to come through there and I'm going to till up all of that as well. I want to, it got tilled up. That's how it got there. My friend's tractor, he brought it over and he tilled up that area for me. So the area has already been tilled and it still produced the beautiful striped beans for me. It produced lots of cucumbers. Um, I'm not really worried about tilling it up again right now. I'm going to till it up again, give it a good working over. I'm going to till up each of the sides of it where I'm wanting to plant the English peas because that dirt did not do well for my half runner beans. So I don't really have a lot of faith that peas are just gonna thrive in it. I wanna till it up. I wanna bring some dirt from the ground, mix it in with that organic soil. And then from there, we're just gonna try to take care of what we've got. I'm not gonna be tilling them all the time, but we're gonna take care of what we've got. And I think those beds will do better after I give them that little jump, <laughs> that little kickstart. I think I'll have a really good garden area that I can maintain for years to come. I'm just looking forward to it. I'm glad I bought it. Um, I need the help around here doing certain things and the little tiller will help me, I believe. What had happened was, um, this is one of those boring things that I, the men might appreciate, the women might not appreciate, but on a lot of tillers, you can move the wheels in and out for what they call freestyle if you wanna just take your tiller from one part of your property to the other, then you put a little pin through some holes in the axle and you just leave the wheels to do what they want and you can just roll it all over your yard. If you're gonna be using the tiller, you have to pull the tire over those holes and there's, there's holes in the tire as well. And you stick that little pin, it's called a lynch pin, but you would stick it straight down through the holes in the tire rim, which also would go through the axle, then back out the axle, then back out the tire rim. So you're sticking it all the way through the tire and the axle, and it holds the tire in place. And then when you actually crank your tiller and you engage it to till, your tires will spin. And that's what helps your, your tires walk across your yard. Your tiller's tilling in the back of the tiller, but your tires are walking across your yard. And because you don't want to be pushing a tiller or burying it in the ground by pushing hard on it. You want to just kind of let it take it across your yard and kind of do its tilling at its own pace. And that's how that works is those little linchpins in your tire. Well, when I went to pick up my tiller where I bought it, it came in and they put it together for me. And then they called me and told me it was ready to come pick up. And when I went to pick it up, uh, the guy was showing me how to do that with the tires. You know, this is the freestyle position. This is the um, mowing position, they call it. And all of a sudden, one of the linchpins broke. And he said, well, I'm going to go run and get another one, uh, you know, out of the hardware store. I'll be right back. And he came back, and he put another linchpin in it, and they loaded it in my car, and we left. Well, I didn't realize till I got home, and I was going to try to use my tiller, that the linchpin that he put in, he put it in just through the axle. So the tire was in freestyle position and the pin easily just went through the axle because it didn't have anything to stop it from going through the axle. The tire wasn't in the way or anything. And that lynch pin was actually longer than the lynch pin that had broke and came out of it. So when I did try to move my tire over the holes to line up the holes on the tire rim with the holes on the axle and I put the pin through it, I couldn't. 
because the pin was so long that I couldn't uh, fit it inside the tire rim to stick it straight down through those holes. I don't mean to bore you to death, but this is this is things that happen because nothing's easy. <laughs> nothing's easy. Not even buying a brand new tiller is easy. So the, the pin was too long. So I couldn't put my tire into more position and do anything with it right then. So I thought, no big deal, no big deal. I'll go buy me another linchpin tomorrow, no big deal. I'm, it, where I bought it from was 50 something miles from me. I wasn't gonna go all the way back down there just to get a linchpin. So I went starting at the hometown hardware near where I'm at, they didn't have it. We went to the Ace Hardwares in two different cities, they didn't have it. I went to a Napa place that's near me, they didn't have it. I was like, oh no, <laughs> nobody has this. My husband and I finally had to drive about 25 miles and we found a Home Depot and then we couldn't find it anywhere. I, I couldn't find it, but I wasn't leaving that Home Depot without asking somebody. Um, I drew it on a piece, I traced it on a piece of paper the exact size I needed. I traced the one from the other tire and a man that worked there finally helped me and he found a certain drawer that was, you know, I never even saw that the drawer would pull out with linchpins in it, but he just knew where they were and I found one. <laughs> so it literally was a couple of weeks of running around to all these hardware stores and thinking about it. And then just, it was so hot. I was like, I don't even care today. I don't even care. <laughs> but I finally found the linchpin and I was finally yesterday morning able to put them all on there and to have my tiller walk across the yard while I was tilling and I was so excited. So that's Christmas in August for me. That's all I need. Just things for my garden is all I ever really want anyway. But I got it accomplished and it feels good when you set your mind on something, as I said earlier, and you get it accomplished. It feels good. After seeing all what has went on in Hawaii, it, it just dumbfounds me. It is so, so sad and so tragic what has went on in Lahaina and other communities around Lahaina with the fires just with the whole situation. And that's all I'm gonna say about that, the whole situation. Um, it just, it, I can't even sit here and complain about anything I've got. I can't complain about the heat. I can't complain about the lack of rain because while it was, it was a test to your endurance <laughs> and I didn't do too good on the test. While it was, it was a test to us and everything, we're okay, we're fine. We did have a lot of fires here in Louisiana, all over Louisiana. Um, some really, really bad fires in Beauregard Parish, Sabine Parish. But we also had fires around here. And our fire departments, I will say, did wonderful. And I'm so happy with them because one of the fires that we had around here was right down the road from me. My husband and I had went on a drive and we came across a fire in Mount Hermon, Louisiana, which is near the Mississippi state line. We were just driving and we rode up on a fire. And so we, we turned and went away from it because all of the fire department trucks were on the road and everything. We didn't want to be in the way. So we turned and went another direction and it was a pretty big fire, but um, I heard nobody was hurt and no buildings were damaged. So that was good. But I, I told my husband, it was on one of these days, it was very, very hazy and it was just, it was like we were a tinderbox down here. We were a tinderbox. I had been hearing about all those other fires, but this was the first one we had rode up on on one of our drives. And um, so I told him, I said, you know what? I said, I'm just ready to go home. I said, today just feels weird. I'm, I'm ready to go home. <laughs> so we did. We went to, if you're from around here, we got to Kentwood, Louisiana, and we turned on the interstate to head south. Well, I told my husband, I said, I swear it looks smoky ahead of us. It looks smoky. And he said, no, nah, I don't think so. And I said, well, it's blue sky, blue sky, blue sky, blue sky, and then smudgy sky. I said, I don't know. Well, as we went over a couple of hills, we realized it was big plumes of smoke. It was a lot of smoke. My sister texted me right about then and said, you need to keep an eye on this, that they're having a fire in a mitt. And Amit, Louisiana is another town around here. And sure enough, they were having a big, huge fire uh, near the parish line of their parish and my parish. And so we were like, man. And actually from our front door, we could see the smoke. I'll show you a picture really quick.
But when we started coming down our road, my husband said, I think there's a fire on our road. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh. And as we went over some hills, it, smoke, we were driving towards smoke. I didn't know what to do because I didn't want to just turn around because if it was past our house, I wanted to be able to get to our house to save things if I could. I didn't know what was going on. So I said, well, let's just keep going. So sure enough, it was about a quarter mile past our house. Uh, I didn't even know if anybody knew about it. And we have hills around here and I couldn't see any fire trucks. And let me show you a picture of what I was looking at when I pulled in my driveway. So as I pulled in my driveway, I realized the fire was on our side of the road and it was down near some property of a man I know. I don't have his phone number, but my really good friend does. So I texted my good friend and I said, um, there's a fire in front of so-and-so's house. I said, you may want to text him real quick, make sure he knows because his house is way off the road. And so I texted, I started texting my neighbors who live nearest there because I didn't even know if they knew it was burning. And I texted them, and then I just started texting every neighbor around me, across the road, behind me, everybody, to let everybody know there's a fire on our side of the road. And then after that, I was just gonna, I guess, ride down there and call 911. I didn't know what to do. And my neighbor, who I had texted first, because they were closest to the fire, they texted me and said, we're on site, we're down here. They've got fire trucks and dozers, and they're trying to get a handle on it. So that was good. <laughs> And, um, and they did, they got it out that night. It was funny, the next day, about one o'clock the next day after lunch, I rode to town and when I came back, it had flared up again. And so I pulled in the driveway of the man that helped, had helped fight it the day before. And I said, look, that fire is flaming up. Do you think the homeowner knows? And he said, they're out of town. He said, I'm watching it for them. So he ran down there. And next thing you know, the fire trucks are going by and they had to go put it out again and it burned even more. This is what it burned when I rode by it uh, that day. But it burned even some more of that the next day. And um, so, whew, you just never know. I woke up Sunday morning, I told my husband, I said, I don't know if I'm just starting to get suspicious of all these fires, but I said, it looks hazy again. I said, let me walk outside and just see if I smell anything. I just opened my door, I didn't even have to walk out and I smelled smoke. I said, oh no, here we go again. And I got in my car this time and went to go see where it was coming from, where was the fire at? Cause I was really worried. And I rode all the way about four miles and I didn't see anything. And I turned around and came home and I told my husband, I said, I smell smoke, but I don't see anything. And um, well, we, it was hazy looking, but it was just hazy everywhere I went. It, it, it never got any worse. Well, come to find out, we did have two fires that morning down by our interstate exits, right along the exits. And when the next day on Monday, my husband and I saw them when we got on the interstate to go somewhere. Y'all, it's just people that throw out cigarettes. I think the fire on our road started out near the edge of the road. The two fires by the interstate started near the edge of the road. I don't know about the other fires that I saw, but people, I think, just simply will not stop throwing out their cigarette butts, even when we're in a, a terrible red flag situation, burn ban and everything. They just will not stop throwing out their cigarettes. And to you out there that might do that, you're probably not watching my videos, but if you do that, if you're in the habit of throwing out your cigarettes, um, just know that you could kill somebody by doing it because uh, we did have one fatality yesterday in Folsom, Louisiana uh, of an elderly woman uh, from a fire. And so these fires that are just, people just refuse to quit throwing out their cigarettes could really start harming people. We have had a little bit of rain now. I'm hoping this danger will go away I'm hoping it could stay dry for a while though, so you never know, but I'm hoping. That's my prayer. My prayers big time go out to the people in Lahaina. I'm gonna put some hashtags on this video for them. I want them to know that people have not forgotten them. They are begging for people to not forget them because they do feel forgotten right now from the response or lack thereof that they've gotten. They do feel forgotten and I don't want them to ever think they're forgotten. I, I can't forget them. I'm seeing the images. There's a channel on YouTube called Hawaii Real Estate. 
I would ask everybody to go subscribe to that channel and keep up with he's posting two and three times a day with real footage out of Lahaina's area. That's where he is. And he's posting uh, interviews with families that have went through the tragedy. Some of the families have lost people, lost their homes. Most all of them have lost their income. And um, it's a very tragic situation. And if anything you can do to help, I'd appreciate. But I'm trying to use my platform at the end of this video right now to ask people to keep them in your prayers. Send a few bucks if you can afford it. Um, when you watch his videos, they give links on how to give. And the money is really straight to the people. They're giving out their Venmos and their cash apps or whatever they have. And you can connect straight with the person whose video you're watching and hearing their story. It's not going through organizations that are taking fees and a lot of expenses off the top of your donations. Or your donation might not ever get filtered to Hawaii. It might get filtered somewhere else, but not in this case. In this case, if you um, go to the links that he provides straight to the cash apps and everything, you'll be given straight to these people who you are seeing and talking to on the video. So I pray for them and I ask you to keep them in your prayers and in your hearts and minds. We are one in this world. We are really one, especially we are one with Americans. We pray for them. This is Lainey from Hilltop Home Place. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Good luck to everybody on your fall gardens. Keep me posted on how you're doing and I'll try to keep you posted on mine. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.